it's on a piece of paper and then it's existing somewhere in the ether between that piece of paper and me and the camera and the viewer, you know? And it's like, how do we grab this and this, this um, phantom almost and fill it with humanity and fill it with authenticity and fill it with um, contradiction and truth? Then it's about working hard to kind of like maintain that and continue respecting that. So like approaching this scene was just like another step in respecting the, the endeavor as a whole. Filmmaker Magazine presents Back to One with Peter Rinaldi. Peppa Essiedu is an actor. He sat down with me in cyberspace to talk about the work Do you have a typical way that you like to begin the process of inhabiting a character? Um, to read the whole thing, right? Because I feel like, especially for actors, um, when you get an audition for something, often you read the script. I mean, like, the, the real lazy ones of us, which is 99.9% .9 of us, will like thumb through the script to find the lines particularly that the character says, not even the scenes that the character is in, but the lines that the character says, as if a character is defined only by what he or she says, which is very much not this, the case. But um, even that 0.0001% that do read the entire script, you're still kind of reading it from the point of view of your character, you know? So you're not kind of like giving a similar amount of empathy or a similar amount of um, attention to other plot beats or characters in the script. So I think it's a really important thing, just as a basis, as a starting point, to read the whole thing with proper openness and curiosity, divorced just from your character. You know, you've got to get a sense for the world that you're going to be a part of telling. You've got to get a sense of the style of it. You've got to get a sense for the arc of it, the um, journey of it, before we can even start kind of like zeroing in on where your character or the, the, the part that your character might play within that, you know? So it's definitely better to go out, look at the big stuff first before zeroing in on the more specific stuff rather than going into this is my character and this is what he or she says and this is how he or she is to script, describe and then trying to apply it to the, the rest of the world, you know? This is a remarkably like patient, uh, um, not scared, way of doing it it seems like and it's from other interviews i've listened to with you you have this it seems like this a similar kind of not so worried about nailing this quickly like like even even with what you were talking about kwame you know like you were showing up even on the set of I may destroy you with questions about how you were going to move as him, how you were going to um, even look at your phone as him. Like, uh, meaning like you, you showed up there not with this rigid way of decision making way I'm going to play him, but with questions. And it's and I want you to talk about that. Is that true? And is that and how necessary is this? is this kind of patience or this kind of like um, fluidity with the approach? It's, it's very difficult because um, it can be misconstrued as, oh great, I don't need to do any work, you know? And if I just like turn up, it'll come to me, you know? And that is not the case at all. And that often is a kind of excuse to not make decisions or not, um, not be bold in your thinking or your imagination about things. So like, I guess it's a, it's a, it's a halfway house between the two because yeah, the, I, I would say it is true. I try not to approach any of the characters that I play with a kind of straight jacket. Um, I try not to kind of come at them being with, with a set of demands or a set of 
parameters um, by which these characters have to live by. I like to kind of like give the characters license to independently emerge and find themselves. But that does require, it does again, like I suppose speak to this thing of like immersing yourself in the world of the story that you're telling and, and informing yourself um, a lot about who you're talking to, why you're talking to them, what you want from them. These kind of big, like very simple kind of questions. You have to do all of that work to allow yourself to have like, yeah, quite an open-ended, curious, question mark pocked um, approach to allowing character emerge. But like, if, if you can do that, and for me that comes from doing plays, you know, I've done a lot of plays and the way like theater works, at least in, in Britain, you like get four or five or sometimes even six weeks to rehearse a play. So of course it means, wow, I've got time to kind of allow choices to marinate and, and grow. Um, but like, I do think that you can kind of do the same thing with, um, with television, even though there's, there's no rehearsal, but it just means that you have to do a lot of that kind of like filling in the detail work um, before you start, which is what I did. I wasn't able to fully appreciate what you were doing with Kwame until I saw what you did with Hamlet. And I, then, I had, then I went back to watch almost all of your scenes again. I may destroy you because I, I was so um, um, impressed by this uh, the physicality with Hamlet that you were doing. And then when I go back and I watched what you were doing with Kwame, there was this physicality that I didn't appreciate the first time. This, this, your eyes. It was like you, a lot of the work was in your eyes. And, and there was a whole other, it felt like a whole other actor um, than what I saw in Hamlet. And so how much does the physicality, the body movement play into your approach and if you could talk about these two characters and approaching them in that way yeah i mean like physicality is important to me but it's um a uh, it's about having an a, a conscious unconsciousness of it so like um i never i or well, at least i hope that i'm never at any point thinking consciously about doing um, a thing, you know, mm. doing like a walk or a stance or whatever in the moment of doing it. I play about a lot, like, especially with plays, especially in rehearsals, I play about a lot, like, with different, like, probably quite extreme and, like, pretty bad, un, like, truthless, like, um, attempts at finding character. But, like, for me, it's just as in, an important language and uh, as an important vocabulary to a character as the words that they say. You know, so I keep on coming back to like when we approach a character in an audition in the script, we're so kind of like concerned about what they say. That's like maybe 20% of what mm. will actually make up a character anyway. So it requires more than that. But yeah, the thing, the, I suppose the difference between Kwame and Hamlet is to do. I mean, like Hamlet particularly is that they're both going through actually like quite traumatic stages in their lives and they're both responding to um, big, big, big losses or, or yeah, events that happen to them. And I think the thing around Hamlet is he's got a more tightly wound um, manic energy to him or at least mine did. Um, in terms of his search for answers of, um, or, or, or his search for sense, putting sense to what had happened to him and what he should do next. And like the question of why, 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 how, 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 who, 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 all of these things, his, his world is full of questions. And that kind of got mirrored in his, um, in his, in the way he moved, you know, like he, I, he, he's never really still, apart yeah. from when he's speaking to the audience. Like those moments of soliloquies mm. um, when it's just him and the audience, which again is a time that he can kind of like his, he, he can slow down and calm a bit because he's, 
he's talking to himself. He's looking inside himself. He's allowing himself space to like be really truthful. He's not wearing a mask. He's not putting on an antic disposition when he's with the audience. So that allows him to be still a bit. But for the rest of it, there is a momentum to the play and a momentum to his action that kind of goes all the way from that first scene to him um, dying at the end of a fight, at the end of the play. So there's a much more manic, um, yeah, like hot stepped energy to his physicality. Whereas Kwame, um, I think responding to what happens to him, like there's very much a before and after. Before you see like an exuberant, confident, front footed, full bodied version, uh, version of him, which is how he lives his life. Um, uh, he is confident, he is in control, he is happy, you know, he's doing his thing. But after what happens to him, happens to him, there's a kind of sense of retreat internally, there's a sense of introspection, and there's a much more stillness, there's much more um, quietness and um, thoughtfulness, you know, both in both in a good way, in, in a healthy way and an unhealthy way. And that mirrors in his kind of, the the, the way he moves, he doesn't, he kind of like is a little bit on edge, but he doesn't make, you don't really see him making sudden movements. You know, he's kind of like protecting himself, keeping himself mm -hmm. safe. Mm -hmm. um, and that is again, yeah, mirrored in, in, in the way he holds himself, the way he walks, the way he sits, the way he lies. Um, and yeah, it, that, that, I suppose the culmination of that is when there's a moment in the latter episode where he kind of like um, ha has a hug with another character and there's a sense of, release and there's a mm. sense of um giving himself up at that point which is kind of like yeah indicative of everything he's been holding through the series up until that point he kind of like allows himself to let go yeah and and see this is something i still don't understand with with actors you, you know you you preface this whole uh, uh what you're talking about by saying like you don't you don't want to think about you know how to stand as him you don't want to think about how to move as him or making this conscious thing and, and yet you you have to be in the moment and there is a certain um there's choices that have to be done uh, um in the scene and they have to be done again and then again and then again as, as the takes go on and i don't understand how you can continue take after take to to not fall into that um, conscious uh, choice attempt, uh, especially in regards to space and movement. Um, I guess, again, that goes back to curiosity because um, there isn't a right answer. There isn't a way of doing it. There's no shot that you've done that is like the, the ideal one, you know? They'll never use a whole shot in the edit anyway. There'll always be a bit of this, a bit of that, a bit of this, a bit of that, and a bit of this anyway. So it doesn't care. it doesn't matter if that one shot is better than the other. What does matter is that the um, the endeavor in terms of like searching for the right thing, searching for truth, searching for uh, having a curiosity about um, what you're trying to achieve that remains. So like you can ask the question again and again and again and again and again, and you might not get the answer or you, or you can um, set yourself up for the answer to be different. That allows it to remain in the moment. That allows it not to be a replication, a repetition of what's gone before because you're not chasing um, mimicry or imitation. You're chasing something that you, ha you don't know yet. You know, you haven't done yet. Um, and I think, yeah, curiosity, having a real curiosity and openness to um, what may be or what may happen allows you and facilitates you doing that. Here's a quote from you about curiosity, and it has to do with uh, stage work. You have to train yourself to have an openness and a curiosity about the audience that's in front of you. That, I think, kind of pushes you into a state of readiness, a state of immediacy, that allows you to stay physically connected and emotionally connected. It's kind of like what you're, what you're talking about, what you just talked about. But, in, but what you were talking about here in this particular quote was this, this idea of incorporating the audience and the curiosity of the audience and that particular energy into your work night after night on, on the stage and, and allowing that to help you be in, in the moment, which I found fascinating. But if you could just 
talk about how how did that come to you though like you're so young like like th- this feels like something that somebody would, who's been on the stage their whole life would finally get to i guess like obviously i'm number one like really lucky to have had like a certain training like i went to school a really great school called guildhall school of music and drama to study acting when i was quite young i was 18 when i went there and that's quite classical training a theater based training so we we kind of spoke a lot about plays i guess and how to do plays but like yeah from when i started working professionally i've been doing plays pretty consistently and working at the places like the Royal Shakespeare Company, the National Theatre in this country, Royal Court, and like had the opportunity to work alongside and observe like really experienced and fantastic actors. So I've always had an interest in what they do and I'd always speak to them and like question them and ask them how they are so good, et cetera, et cetera. But I think you also have like an innate, you start to get an innate understanding of like what feels like it works because there's something about being on stage in front of an audience that's completely unforgiving if what you do is good there will you'll 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 get the relevant response but if what you do is not is not truthful is not real is like blocking them out or whatever you don't get that same response and doing that again and again and again and again is a real education you know it educates you on how to do it so i think um yeah that as the sooner especially for theatre acting and to an extent um, screen acting, sooner you get like a feel for like the fact that the relationship is three way is between you who or what you're affecting in the play and the audience. It's a three way triangular relationship. The sooner you get an understanding and appreciation for that, the more exciting it does become. And the more kind of like limitless the um, opportunity for something to occur in the moment is to, to, because, because the audience will always be different. Even if like the, the stage is the same, the actor that you're talking to is the same, the line that you're saying is the same, the audience will not be the same. You'll never get an audience where it's like 1,000 however many people on one night and exactly the same 1,000 however many people the next night. And even if you did, every single one of those people would be feeling different on the second night to how they felt the first night. So it's a different audience that you're dealing with. So it's a different moment that you're connecting to. So yeah, I think it does come from like a a kind of repetition and like doing it and getting it wrong. And then other times where you get it a bit less wrong and you learn from that. So tell me if I have this wrong. You meet Michaela at school. She writes a scene that gets you an agent. Like you guys do this scene and that's what attracted your agent to you. You stay friends after school. She's writing this series for a long time. You're friends. You're you're friends enough that when she had her trauma that she depicts in the show in a certain way. You're one of the people she talked to about that in real life. She's making this show about that, centered around that, fictionalized and everything. But she never thinks of you for the role of Kwame until an, a casting director says, hey, what about, <laughs> what about Papa? And so... Do I have that right? Yeah, yeah, that's spot on. <laughs> so when you somehow get the role <laughs> that she's been writing, I mean, there's so many parallels to real life here. I mean, you're, you're playing like one of her best friends in the show. And so you have to, um, it's a totally fictionalized character for you, but there is a certain reality to your relationship and your connection uh, that had to be um, mined out and everything. Just take me through the process of what you were bringing to this character, how she was responding to, to that. The idea that you guys are both friends in real life, how that is playing in into this whole thing. And and you and you've talked about how she 
had like a loose grip on on decisions about about a lot of things in the show and this is probably why i responded so well to this but i'm assuming she probably had loose grip on how she responded to your character and what you were bringing to it i mean loose grip is an interesting way of phrasing it because like it's it's very much a um hold on tightly let go lightly type approach you know like she's got a real certainty about what she wants and what she likes and what is right and what is wrong and what she's writing and what she's not writing. So it definitely wasn't a sense of a free for all, but it was about like how um, her uh, openness to allow like other people's creativity and imagination to augment what was already there, which was already, which had structure and had backbone and spine and authenticity you know it was her she had a real kind of openness and readiness to allow us to add and um yeah augment what was already there but in terms of like our friendship like i wouldn't say it was necessarily influential on the way we worked other in 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 a in a way that was different to how we might have worked had we not known each other like i feel like we've got like quite a good creative language together joint uh, jointly understood creative language and it's very easy for us to like talk and um bounce ideas off each other and understand each other most importantly so i find her really easy to understand i feel like if she t- tells me what she's looking for i can quite easily translate that into something that makes sense to me so maybe that does come from having a prior relationship with her and like an ease with her but it was um it was more just like a really um, well-oiled professional relationship, you know, where there was like a lot of mutual respect and a lot of mutual commitment and um, care over what we were making. And um, yeah, I suppose that allowed us to create something that we both felt we had a joint ownership over. Um, but it definitely wasn't a thing of like, and I think I think it's kind of good, you know, like I'd hate to think that I got the part because I was friends with her. Um, I hate, I'd hate to think that, like, I always wonder that when people are like, oh, I wrote this part for you. Um, then it's like, what? So I've, I've got to do it and prove to everyone that I know that, that I am the right person for this. What about if there's someone else better for me? You know, I always think, right, that's actually quite a difficult situation to be in. So, um, yeah, it felt good that like we had like a process of creation that we both contributed to. Um, with regards to Kwame, that 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 was in line with um, our professional responsibilities. I really responded to this show and continue to respond to the show in a way that is um, different than anything else I like, and, and I'm trying to figure out why. Uh, like, look, I'm a I'm a white man, cis straight, married, I don't do drugs, like all I want. And yet all I want is some a show like this where somebody is allowed to express themselves and tell their story without any hindrance from a bunch of fucking people in suits. But probably what I respond to most in this show is the tone and the way that the storytelling Uh, doesn't have this archaic kind of way of highlighting certain things in the performances that say, well, no, this is special. The music, the music swells up here. Like this is a, this is important. It felt like, it felt like real life. It felt like you have to lean in. You have to constantly lean in. And all of these times when you think, okay, now they're going to make a statement here about this this decision, it gets turned and totally off balance all the time, like in real life. And how many times do we see anything like this? I mean, this is why I hope that people are responding to it like they are. I think that this is why on on top of a a lot of other reasons. But I want to know, speaking specifically about one scene where it really comes to, to life for me, the scene where Michaela's character finds out that you had sex with the woman the way that argument plays out, it has a choreography that doesn't feel choreographed. The way you utter 
you know, important points that she picks up on. It's so, um, it's done so subtly, so real that like in a, in a lesser show, it'd be like, oh, you have to, you have to really sell me that. You have to sell that so she can, you know, and then I would be totally out of it. So I want to know how this kind of level to the performance, this kind of tone was established. That's one of the things where like, because all of it is about like group, like dynamic and collaboration and like everyone being great, et cetera, et cetera. I think at that point, at some point you've got to give props to Michaela, right? Because she's written something. Because like what you're talking about, for example, with the thing about like, there isn't music that's specifically underpinning a scene in order to um, engage the audience on a, um, certain emotional level, for me, that's a sign of confidence, right? If you really have confidence that what you have written and what you have created does what you want it to do, you don't need to um, rely on um, something else as a crutch to kind of like really hammer it home. You can actually just like let it tell the story it is telling. You can even use music to kind of like complicate that or make it yes. more complicated or to knock someone off balance, you know? Asking questions again, giving an audience the right and the respect to be able to respond to what they're seeing and hearing and receiving exactly. in, what fa in what way that feels right to them. And I think that's ultimately what we do want because um, I suppose that making, yeah, content, whatever you want to call it, before it was kind of like led by focus groups and like talking to focus groups and seeing what these focus groups are saying they like or don't like. And then there's algorithms, which are even more scientific, which are kind of like measuring what even more than what we know about what we do and don't like. But like, I don't think there can ever be a substitute for just like real pure human instinct and truth and authenticity. And if you are really like honest in your pursuit of that, I don't think anyone will ever be able to argue with you. And that's what we, that's what we love about great art. That's what we love about great music. That's what we love about great sporting moments. You know, there's yeah. something that is just like fundamentally human. That is not, that is kind of unadulterated that, um, that you can't manufacture if you tried that, um, that we just connect to on a different level. Not that I'm saying that that's what we managed to achieve in that scene necessarily, but I do think with Michaela, that's her modus operandi. That's um, the genesis of all of her ideas. And that's the way that she works. And I think that's why people respond to her work so much. Um, in that scene, it kind of like played out very much like a play. It's a very long scene, you know, relatively mm -hmm. for a 28 minute, um, episode, you know, that scene itself is like a long time. And it was actually written very late in the day. That was not the, that wasn't, that whole episode was completely different for most of, and most of the time until we shot it. And then oh, wow. she was right, she was rewriting, 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 rewriting. And then we had this Halloween uh, POC paint and wine night and we all had to get like different costumes and like, yeah. <laughs> et etc. et cetera. Et cetera. But, um, yeah, I think because of the length of it, it's about like not interrupting and just like following instinct. And like me, me, Waruche, who plays Terry and Michaela, by this point, we'd been filming for like maybe four months or something like that. We developed a real trust with each other um, and a respect for each other. So no one's trying to impose anything on anyone else. We're just letting each other do their thing and just like having the openness to respond. A lot of times lately on this show, I've been talking to actors about this idea of a responsibility that they feel like they have to the, a particular person in the audience, people in the audience, regarding a certain scene like Paul Meskel from, from normal people having a, a responsibility to people dealing with depression. And he talked about how that kind of responsibility didn't help him in the scene. Like, you know, he had, he had to almost discard that. And I was wondering if you, in your scene where you had to depict the trauma, having this whole thought process of there are going to be people that have been traumatized in a similar way that never saw anything like this on the screen. Did you have to deal with that? uh before you were doing the scene and how did you deal with that 
I guess I, I actually mainly dealt with that before I accepted the part, actually. It's at that point that I'm having those kind of thoughts. Um, because it's not really just that scene that kind of has a responsibility to the people that watch it. That watch it. It's the whole portrayal and the way um, the story is told in its entirety. Um, and who's doing it, you know, and how it's done. So it's not necessarily like, oh my God, it's this one scene, even though there is a great significance to that scene specifically to a lot of people, it's not in its isolation, it's in its totality. So it's at those times that I'm thinking about it, but like, then I'm just thinking, okay, we need to think about how, it's not necessarily like because of our responsibility, but it's more about like, how do we do this justice? How do we like respect this? Again, like going back to the, the, the idea that this character exists independently from me, you know, it's, it's on a piece of paper and then it's existing somewhere in the ether between that piece of paper and me and the camera and the viewer, you know? And it's like, how do we grab this and this, this um, phantom almost and fill it with humanity and fill it with authenticity and fill it with um, contradiction and truth, you know? Then it's about working hard to kind of like maintain that and continue respecting that. So like approaching this scene was just like another step in respecting the, the endeavor as a whole. Then, you know, like the responsibility is also not just my own. It's like, I, 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 do, I do like, the performance but then it goes through an editing suite and then it goes for a grade and then it goes for a sound whatever you know so like the character is mine and then it's not mine you know so it's um true, true. i think it's important for us as performers to not kind of like bear the load of responsibility in the moment as we're trying to do what we're doing because then you can't actually focus on it and thereby um you end up underserving what what what, what you were otherwise doing but like it is important to have an um, understanding of like the significance of it and to also do that kind of thinking at an early stage of the process. During this time of lockdown, when things are starting to open up a little bit and people are really itching to, to start work again, I have an actor friend who's six months away from his 90th birthday. He said, you know, I, I think you should be asking actors this. And I think it's really because he's thinking about it. Like, he's obviously a vulnerable, he's a very healthy, he's probably going to outlive me, but he's in, in a very vulnerable category. But for even young actors, at what point, if like, it, if, if whatever you were about to do next, if they said, yeah, we're going to start, we're going to start to to get together now and do this, like, what would have to be laid out for you to feel safe to do your work again on a set? It's a really difficult question to answer because like then we're, I mean, that's a question about how much do we trust the people that make the decisions by which we live, right? Essentially politicians. And I can speak definitely on politicians in this country in a way that I probably can't as much in America, but like politicians are not purely motivated by the health of 100% of people in this country. There are, there are calculations being made about like acceptable losses or whatever um, versus like economic disaster and whatever. And it's, not, it's, not, it's actually not for me to say that one is right or one is wrong, but definitely when it comes to people in vulnerable um, categories being forced to enter into a workplace that is being officially um, sanctioned as safe, but might not actually be practically um, the, 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 the case, it's a really difficult, um, it's a really difficult question to answer because then are we saying that, oh, the, we can only make work for uh, actors under the age of 60 that have got like a proven track record of like great health or have already had the um, virus and um, come back and are still healthy. We can't say that that is the, um, the world that we want to work in in the short and definitely not the long term. So it's a really difficult question to answer. And my answer is going to be very different from someone else's answer, you know? So I feel like the responsibility is on production companies, both on, on the stage and film and television, 
outside to go beyond what is being required of them by their insurance clauses or by their um, by governments and think about their their employees and how to 100% guarantee the safety or to guarantee the set or maybe not guarantee but to do everything in their power to um, prioritize the safety of the employees many of which are freelancers freelancers who are dedicated to making work brilliant for them which allows them to grow as companies Peppa Esiedu, I am fantasizing about you coming to New York for some kind of future project and us sitting down together for another episode. That would be amazing. I would love that. Till then, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Back to One is a production of Filmmaker Magazine, which is a publication of IFP, the Independent Filmmaker Project. Listen to back episodes of this podcast at filmmakermagazine.com or wherever you get your podcasts.